Hello, I'm Susan Zink. Welcome to Montessori for Everybody. I have been a part of Montessori education in one way or another for over 30 years and I'm hoping that the love that I have developed for this approach to education is something I can share with you and help you to benefit the children that you work with, that you live with, whether you're a parent or a teacher. I am one of those people who, if something is really, really important to me, I want to understand it better and better. I also want to evaluate it critically. I have looked for ways that Montessori education may be missing the boat, things that might be not the way that they should be, things that need to be updated, and I have been amazed over the last few decades how little there is that I would change from what I've learned from my studies of Dr. Maria Montessori. Over the last few decades, the learning research has validated her approach again and again. Some of the research that I most enjoyed studying when, when I was uh, in, in college, when I was t earning a, a psychology degree, is the work of Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck has studied the way that we think about learning or what we believe about learning and how that affects how effectively we actually do learn. She calls this mindset. There's essentially two different ways that people approach how they learn. One is, the, is what's called a fixed mindset. The idea that you're smart or you're not. You're good at it or you're not. And this is very, very limiting. When children believe they're good at math, they do better. Even if, if there's no other factors that, that would cause you to expect that. And equally so, if children believe they're bad at math, they tend to do poorly and struggle with it. The alternate mindset, the one that Montessori education encourages, enhances, and tends to develop in children, is the idea that the more you work at something, or the more energy and attention that you put into it, the better you're going to get. This is validated in the research again and again as being true, but what's even more important is that if you believe that, you're going to put the energy and the attention into learning that you need to get good at something. In the Montessori approach, children are empowered to take charge of their own learning. They're given the materials, they're given the prepared environment that they need to be able to learn things on their own, to be able to choose what they want to learn at different times, so that when their interest is, is giving them energy to learn, they're able to apply that energy to that task right then. They don't have to wait for math time, or for geography time, or for the specialist to come to do art. They get to take that energy that they have and apply it to the task that they want to do right then. When children do this, and especially when they do this repeatedly, they take the addition, the work, the materials to help them learn to add off the shelf again and again and again, they develop not only the ability to add, but they develop a mindset. They develop the attitude that they are learners. They develop the attitude that not only are they good at math, they're able to manage their own learning. This is perhaps one of the most important things about Montessori education. As a parent, as a teacher, I encourage you to use this understanding that we have as you seek to use Montessori's wisdom in with your children. There are several different ways to do this. Primarily is the entire Montessori approach, that you prepare the environment, you encourage independence in the children, you respect their own choices in learning and, and empower them to make those choices. You refrain from interrupting them when they are taking work off the shelf again and again. You encourage that repeti repetition and when they are doing the same thing again and again, you let that sequence of learning develop. But there's other things that you can do as well. In Montessori, you learn to, to take an approach that, that keeps your judgments of the child from, from interfering with their learning. <clears throat> if a child shows you a piece of art, what's most important is that child, that child's art, that child's process. Your opinion of it isn't very important. And in fact, I would encourage you to put that in the background. 
put that in the background and use your interaction with that child to encourage them to make their own judgments. If they're drawing something and they want it to look like the thing they're drawing, there are some value judgments that can be appropriate there. If a child is learning to draw a horse, it can be appropriate for them to look at several drawings they've done of horses and judge which one they're most pleased with. If that's the mode a child is in when they present their work to you, then your job isn't to make any judgments about it or share any judgments that you have. Your job is to turn it back to that child. Well, tell me about your work. What do you like about what you did here? What do you think you might want to do differently next time? When you put it back with the child, you're doing several things. One, you are respecting what the, the, the work and the, the child's ability to manage that work. But you're also doing what we were just talking about earlier in terms of encouraging a mindset of the learner. If your orientation to what the child has done is, oh, you're a good artist, even if it's positive, you're getting in the way of that mindset. If the child decides there's some fixed entity of being good at things, they're not going to do the work when they get to something that's not easy for them. Whether that's math or drawing a likeness or riding a horse or skiing, the orientation you want to develop is that of if you want to be good at it, you need to figure out what you need to do to learn it and put the time in to practice in an effective manner. That's the mindset that is going to help children to be effective in their learning. That's the mindset that's going to help them be effective in whatever they do in their life. And that's definitely the mindset that Montessori education encourages and develops. An essential part of the role of the adult in the classroom is to connect the children to the environment which consists primarily of materials which allow them to educate themselves. This primary function is reflected in the use of the terms guide, or the one I prefer, mentor. This term helps adults remember to be a resource to the children in managing their own learning, not take charge of the learning process. The two basic areas that children start in from the very young age of two and a half or three are the sensorial and the practical life area. The sensorial area is probably the area for which Montessori is most well known. If someone is familiar with Montessori materials, it may be the classic pink tower, it may be the knobbed cylinders that the child matches into the cylinder block for which they're made to go into or the corresponding knobless cylinders. The building toys that children use today are an offshoot of these kinds of materials. What distinguishes the Montessori materials is the very careful craftsmanship and the way that they are organized to teach the children a progression of understanding. These are the dimensional materials of the sensorial area. The sensorial area, as it sounds like, is designed to train the children's different senses. Some of the materials are used to train the senses in combination. The child moves the cylinders as they see them, so it's a combination of movement and visual experience. Some of the exercises are designed to focus on just one sense. The sound cylinders are simply little cylinders that the child can shake and listen to to discriminate different sounds, the louder from the softer, to match them and then to grade them. The tactile sense is developed by having the children gently touch touch tablets to see which ones are rougher and which are smoother. The baric sense, the ability to discriminate weights, has a set of tablets, as does the thermic sense, where the child with the help of a blindfold can touch different tablets to distinguish which ones are cooler and which ones are warmer. Even the sense of taste and the sense of smell has a place to be developed in the Montessori classroom. Little cylinders that, or little bottles that have different scents or different um, items to taste, spices, or, or juices or something like that can be set out as well. What Montessori believed was that if you develop the children's senses, they then have a framework on which to build all the other information that comes into their lives. If they have that sense of dimension, if they have that sense of being able to touch lightly, 
other things that follow, such as reading and writing, and having an appreciation of the natural world will come easily and naturally to the child. That is what the sensorial area is designed for. One of the areas that usually isn't discriminated in the Montessori area is that of the sense of proprioception. The sense of proprioception is knowing where you are in space. The child who's old enough to move from the crib to the bed has developed enough proprioception, has developed a sense of where they are in space, enough to roll back away from the edge of the bed instead of falling out. Now, one of the exercises that in some Montessori classrooms is distinguished as part of practical life is walking the line. In most Montessori classrooms, there's a line in the room. Here, we have a line that's actually built into the floor. It's actually part of the shape of the room and it leads out into a vine in the hallway that the children can walk as well. What the children can do is walk the thick line or they could choose a very fine part of the line to walk so that they can learn to control their body in space. This is the sense of proprioception that is being developed with the exercise of walking the line. Once the child has mastered these different exercises to train the senses, they're able to apply them in the next Montessori area. The second basic area in the Montessori classroom is the practical life area. Now one of the things that the children learn in the practical life area is the care of the person. Again, one of the most famous Montessori materials that you will see in most early childhood classrooms in some form are the dressing frames. These are simply little frames that have material attached to them with the different types of clothing fasteners so the children can practice. Something like buttoning one of the things that a teacher in a Montessori classroom does is shows the child where to direct their attention. With the exercise of buttoning, the trick, if you will, is turning the button on its side. When the button is turned on its side, the child can easily cause it to move through the buttonhole, whether or not they're buttoning or unbuttoning. So when a teacher gives a lesson with the buttoning frame, they help the child focus their attention for success. Montessori said that the cry of the child is help me do it by myself. That's what the practical life area is about. In addition to the care of the person, which involves dressing themselves, taking care of things like washing their hands properly and blowing their nose properly, in addition to those types of exercises, what the practical life area involves is taking care of the environment. So the children learn to clean up after themselves. They learn to dust, they learn to sweep, they learn to wash dishes, they learn to take care of their own environment. Everything from simply tidying up the items on the shelves to complex cleaning and food preparation tasks. Now another area of the practical life is the exercises of grace and courtesy. Something like Making sure that their, their nose is clean is an exercise that's both grace and courtesy because it's a way we show respect and are considerate of those around us. Something like covering the mouth, teaching the children to cough or sneeze into their elbow so they're not spreading germs in the classroom. Teaching the child to carry a chair properly so they can move it around without bumping into people teaching a child to greet someone, shake hands. These are all lessons in grace and courtesy that the child learns in the Montessori classroom. When the child feels independent, when they feel like they can do for themselves, they feel powerful. And when someone feels powerful, they're willing to risk. They're willing to do what it takes to learn things even when it's something that's difficult or complex. These are some of the gifts that the child receives in the Montessori classroom. Once the children have trained their senses and have learned how to do activities that have several steps and have some, some need to complete things in the right order, they're ready to begin moving into the areas of language and math. One of the wonderful things about the Montessori classroom is the presence of math manipulatives. In fact, I, I think it would be accurate to say that Montessori was one of the originators of having children learn math using math manipulatives. She has some very beautiful materials that she created, such as the golden bead material, 
What the golden bead material does is allow the child with their hands, with their arms, with the muscles of their body to get a sense of 1,000. To get a sense with even the weight involved of how it is different than 100 or 110 or one unit. The child can actually hold in their hands a hundred beads, a thousand beads, and learn the geographical relationship from the two, of the two, without even being told. All they learn is, this is 100, this is 1,000, at least at the beginning. Then the more complex associations are built as the child is ready for that next step. Some of the materials in the Montessori classroom are ones that many, if not most, educators have adopted at this point. Most people would consider that trying to teach a child about fractions without something to hold and see broken into four quarters would be foolish. Even though it was paper plates in the classroom in which I learned fractions, this again is one of those innovations that Montessori created that has extended out into much of education. The beauty in the Montessori classroom that is different than the way that manipulatives are used in most math classrooms is that the child of age three or even younger is able to manipulate these materials when they're just learning them sensorially. With the Montessori bead cabinet, we have cubes, a cube of two. Two times two times two is introduced to the child as simply a cube that has eight little beads they are able to learn the association between cubing and squaring by simply manipulating long chains of beads and cubes of beads and seeing the relationships, feeling the relationships sensorially before they have to worry about abstraction. One of the key concepts that Montessori gave to education is the idea that if you want a child to learn easily, you take them from the concrete to the abstract before they ever see a two with a tiny two up above it, they are able to experience what that feels like in their hands. In addition to the math area, the next area that the child moves into after training the senses and the idea of moving through uh, an exercise by doing several steps in order is the language area. Here again, several of the materials are ones that are now commonplace in classrooms. The sandpaper letters that have the tactile experience for a child to learn the shape of the letters without having to struggle. When a child of three or three and a half traces a letter several times over and over again, the muscles of their arms, the nerves of their fingers have that letter be imprinted into their brain in a way that's effortless and prepares them to write without any strain and having it be a completely joyful experience. Other exercises in the Montessori language area, such as the metal insets, allow the child to have just enough help to learn to prepare for a writing exercise. When the child uses a metal inset and traces with the colored pencil around inside of the triangle, their chance of success is very high. They're given enough of a material, enough of a control, so that their first efforts at making marks on paper are successful and beautiful. This is one of the advantages in the Montessori classroom. Some people have questioned whether or not Montessori introduced ideas such as numbers and, and reading too early to children. But when the child, before they ever attempt to write a word on paper, has had a chance to trace sandpaper letters, has had a chance to experiment over and over again with colored pencils, with beautiful materials that help, help them to control their movements, writing then becomes the natural progression that is easy for them. One of the things that Montessori most wanted to do was avoid the child having strain as they began to learn. The final area in the Montessori classroom is that of the cultural subjects. Now this encompasses all kinds of areas of knowledge that the child may be interested in. Geography, history, botany, zoology, but rather than just looking at books, especially if you're only three, 
what the child is able to do is be introduced to these areas of knowledge and sometimes even master many of the terms and things that are typically not introduced until high school or college at an early age because of the way that they are represented and the way that they are, are given to the child to learn in a way that's easy for them. These are some exercises or some materials that are used in the teaching of geography. One of the first things that the child learns is just the basic breakdown of our earth. The water, land, and I teach also the air or the atmosphere that it's surrounded. That's the basic makeup of the place on which we live. And the child is able to actually touch the globe to feel that difference, to feel where the land is separated from the water, to be able to trace along the different coastlines and get a sensorial experience of the globe on which they live. Once that's mastered, then the child moves on to something a little bit more abstract. The idea that we've given names to different land masses, that the large land mass on which they live is called North America, and perhaps the land that their grandparents came from is called Europe, or Africa, or Asia. These are concepts that we introduce to the child in a way that they can understand, in a way they can begin to explore with the hand. When subjects are introduced in this way, the child has a chance to learn them effortlessly and to enjoy them right from the very beginning. When we are working on geography, we do our best to keep as much of that concrete involved as we can, having objects from the different continents, objects from the different countries for the children to experience. In addition to the geography area, we do the same thing with history. History is presented with a timeline that's laid out on the floor so that the children have a physical representation of time, which is the basis of history. They then can go further into that and understand the different human players that were involved in history, the different eras of the earth, and the historic eras. In addition to the study of history and geography, the cultural subjects include a lot of different scientific explorations for the children. Similar to the map puzzles are the puzzles for the study of botany. The parts of the plant, in this case the tree, are puzzle pieces that the child can manipulate as well as learning the names of the stem or the trunk, the leaves, the branches, and the different aspects of the root. We go from very simple puzzles such as this all the way up to more complex materials for botany as well as for zoology. The child can learn the aspects of the mollusks, such as that they, their defining characteristics are a soft body and sometimes a hard shell. And then the different parts of the anatomy of the mollusk can be studied in very concrete forms, such as simple um, diagrams that are color-coded. The eyes are red in this particular segment and then the tentacles are coated red here and an explanation of these different parts of the anatomy are given. Obviously, if you're dealing with a three-year-old, the words in the book are not going to be what they're going to be focusing on. However, many Montessori children do learn to read very, very early. Unlike some of the criticism that was put forth by Dewey and others, this is not because they're pushed. This is not because they are pressured into focusing on words or symbols too early. Quite the contrary. They are given the opportunity to pass from the very concrete objects that they are learning the words for into movable letters that represent the words and then finally into the printed word that is the most abstract representation for an object. The children learn these things willingly and so many times you will have five, six, and seven-year-old children who have learned to read well enough to use the zoology materials, to use the botany materials to enhance and enrich their understanding of the world, not because they were pressured into doing so. In the Montessori environment, there's a lot of flexibility to be had. The environment that you've seen us exploring today is in a house. It's an environment that is dedicated to children and is used on a regular basis as a Montessori school, but the space limitations have been worked around as best we can. We have globes that sit on map stands that sit above other geometric materials. Most of these materials are used with the older children, the older pre-primary children, which means the children who are age two and a half or three through age six. The primary age group children or elementary age group children from 
what is typically in, an, in a regular school, kindergarten or first grade through third grade, also use the materials. So you'll have a three-year-old simply using the puzzle maps as a puzzle, and you may have a six or a seven-year-old working with them, teaching them the names that that child has already mastered. That is one of the beauties of the Montessori environment, and one of the things that can be included as people bring more of the Montessori education into their homes. If younger children are not taught that their older siblings are a resource, there's something that's being, being lost because of not having that relationship. A child needs to live naturally and not simply have a knowledge of nature. The most important thing to do is to free the child, if possible, from the ties which keep him isolated in the artificial life of a city. We have readily given up our own freedom and have ended up loving our prison and passing it on to our children. Little by little we've come to look upon nature as being restricted to the growing of flowers or to the care of domestic animals which provide us with food, assist us in our labors, or help in our defense. This has caused our souls to shrink and filled them with contradictions. Maria Montessori in The Discovery of the Child One day, the teacher came a bit late to school after having forgotten to lock the cupboard. She found that the children had opened its door. Many of them were standing about it, while others were removing objects and carrying them away. I interpreted the incident as a sign that the children now knew the objects so well that they could make their own choice, and this proved to be the case. This began a new and interesting activity for the children. They could now choose their own occupations according to their own particular preferences. From this time on, we made use of low cupboards so the children could take from them the material that corresponded to their own inner needs. The principle of free choice was thus added to that of repetition of the exercise. Maria Montessori in The Secret of Childhood Although some of the children in our first school could play with some really splendid toys, none of them cared to do so. This surprised me so much that I decided to help them play with their toys. The children were momentarily interested, but then went off on their own. Because a child is constantly passing from a lower to a higher state, his every passing minute is precious. Since a child is constantly growing, he is fascinated by everything that contributes to his development and becomes indifferent to idle occupations. The last part of our program was filmed at the 2013 International Montessori Congress in Portland. The event was significant because it brought together all the large Montessori associations working together with Association Montessori International to unite the Montessori community. Okay, we're here with Bela and Dennis Scott with Hands for Building and we're going to let them tell you about the wonderful engineering tools that they have for children and teenagers and I'm just going to let Bela go ahead and take it away. Okay, um, we are Hands for Building, uh, engineering for kids and teens. We have 13 projects that work, um, turn and move, and you can take a look at some of the projects that we have. We have a Ferris wheel. I'm going to turn that off because it's a little bit noisy. We have a house, and you can see that it is actually a house to scale. Here's the roof with trusses. This is our merry-go-round, our elevator, this is the, uh, this is a tilt and spin, this goes, it works with pneumatics, a little simple pump, and it works with a, uh, a, a switch. And we are a, uh, a complete package. We are marketing everything you see here, all the training um, together uh, for teachers and schools. And the way it's done is we have engineering drawings for everything, all 13 uh, projects. 
and the kids use um, small saws, they use files, they lay out on a foam core board the blueprints, and then they measure the sticks, and they put it in a vise. You can see here a little hand vise. And then they simple the cut, so they cut the wood and they put it on the plan and they slowly construct it. Uh, they use a, a specialty white glue, um, little triangles and put it together.